Hello, welcome to another Register Kettle, your chance to hear about the news from the people that actually write it. Now, it's been an AI-heavy news week so far. We've had ARM's latest chips coming through, which are promising great deal, but uh, we're going to see whether it actually works. We've got power demands, which could cripple nations. And we've got Palantir, uh, Peter Thiel's latest attempt to apply AI to the US government. So, um, Chris, you first off, you've been talking to ARM a lot this week. Can you fill us in on what their plans are on the AI front? Yeah, it's interesting because uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting what ARM has been saying. They, this week, they announced a new set of processor cores and also some new uh, GPU cores. These are the designs that go into people's Android phones and, and uh, other devices. Um, the most interesting thing out of that uh, was that you know, it's the usual uh, claims that these cores are going to be up to about 30% faster than the previous years. Uh, so, mm. you know, that means future devices will be faster. Also, ARM is getting, ARM on the data center side uh, provides pre-baked designs for things like its Neoverse chips. And it pretty much works with fa with uh, factories and fabricators so that you're not just licensing like some digital design from them from, and the logic uh, for these uh, cores, but you're actually getting the physical blueprint that you can just drop onto your die and they take care of all the optimizing because of that because as we're starting to scale down towards things like three nanometer it gets a lot more difficult to to uh, work that into basically to fabricate that and for your core to still work and rather than leave that to the chip licensees that licenses technology from arm um, arm just designs it for them and now it's doing that on the client side so future uh, processors inside things like android devices will have uh, will likely have cores that have been physically designed by ARM rather than just providing the logic, which is an interesting step. Okay. And the other thing they're going with that is that by focusing more and more on CPUs, they really want more AI workloads to be running on CPU cores. At the moment, there's this ongoing notion that you can only do AI properly if you have an AI accelerator. And it's something which NVIDIA loves to push. It's something which uh, Google likes to push. It's something which Sam, uh, Samsung does, but Qualcomm definitely does. And uh, what they're doing there is they want to add their own accelerators inside the processors so that it differentiates them. They're all licensing arms technology. But in order to make them stand out from each other, they all want to have some extra special source in there. So they can claim that their phone is the one that is, is best, or their phone chip is the one that's best. So are you uh, talking MPU then for you know, what everyone else is banking on? Yeah, it's the fact that uh, everyone else is putting custom MPUs into their system on chips for phones and, and, and laptops and other ARM-based devices. Um, but what ARM really wants you to do is to stay on the CPU. They're not saying, they kept, the ARM staff kept telling me, we're not anti-NPU, like we're not at all. <laughs> we, are, we understand that there's going to be some work which you should be able to offload to the MPU. Offload into a GPU, they, weren't, they didn't even seem that excited about because the GPU is going to be busy enough rendering. And also they put lots of effort into making sure that the GPU uh, doesn't eat up all your battery. And so the GPU, just keep stuffing work into the GPU is just going to make your battery life worse. So they want to keep things on the CPU and they're hoping to get up to like 90% of Android apps. Uh, really? Their AI workloads, their local inference on the device, they want to get up to 90% of Android apps doing AI work on the CPU, staying on ARM's CPU. And also that encourages people to keep licensing ARM's cores and not you know, stick to the previous generations and just keep adding MPU separately. It's an interesting, ARM has to work a tight, has to walk a tight rope here because it can't openly say that it doesn't like its customers like Google and Qualcomm putting MPUs. I mean, Google's got like the tensor cores that it puts yeah. into devices now. Um, but on the other hand, ARM um, really would like you to be using its CPU cores for AI. And it's been adding features to its CPU cores to accelerate AI in the CPU. And already they claim 70% of Android apps run their AI workloads on the CPU. So they're like, just, just stick to the CPU. We'll just focus they, there. This is a natural kind of progression. If you look at how, why we have NPUs in these SOCs in the first place, it's because somebody wanted to run machine learning workloads. They wanted to run ma matrix math really fast on these things. And there just wasn't a way to do that on RMVA efficiently. You yep. could and, and and while you know when ARMv9 came out, there were vector extensions that would let you sort of do that. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't adopted that quickly, and so NPUs were a kind of a 
stop gap in terms of being able to push a lot of tops really mm -hmm. early. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, if you can do the matrix math in the core, then you can eliminate a lot of die space that is otherwise consumed by a, a specialized accelerator that basically does nothing other than run these tasks. And mm -hmm. that these NPUs are essentially, they're not quite fixed function, but they're, slight, they're programmable to some extent, but they've they are designed to do one thing really, really well. And so uh, they're not all that versatile. So you're wasting a lot of die area as well, which as you go down to the smaller process nodes, you know, the more specialized features that you have on these dies, the more complications you can run into with things like routing. So yeah. it's, it's, it's a natural progression. And it's, I mean, so do you think the, the MPUs are a one-shot deal then? Or, you know, is this something that, that ARM is right about? You can offload this to the CPU. You know, it, it's hard to say at this point because it de it's going to depend in, in part on how quickly the uh, you can make kind of these AMX engines that are being built into who are the cores efficient. One of the problems that we see in terms of running AI workloads, inferencing on CPUs, even with like Intel stuff, which has had this going back to Sapphire Rapids early last year, is that there's a bandwidth bottleneck that limits what you can do with it. You can't run really large models on CPUs because you run into too many uh, bottlenecks. There's not enough memory bandwidth to shove it in. It's kind of like take, uh, trying to drain a, uh, a swimming pool with a garden hose. <laughs> there's, you know, there's just not enough uh, bandwidth in order to keep it fed or move data from what, where it starts to where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. Well, you've written a lot about high bandwidth memory and how that's actually really crippling the industry in some regards. Yeah, uh, high bandwidth memory uh, is typically seen in the high-end accelerators, stuff like NVIDIA's H100, H200, um, you know, AMD and Intel's stuff. It is rather power hungry compared to what you would see in smartphones and notebooks. There you're typically seeing LPDDR5 these days, which in itself is pretty fast. I mean, the top end Apple products, I think are, are pushing 400 gigabytes per second in terms of memory bandwidth, which sounds like a lot until you consider that, you know, high bandwidth memory equipped chips are pushing 5.3 terabytes per second. However, mm -hmm. those chips are really designed to serve hundreds of people hitting them all at once, you know, large, large batch sizes of people using yeah. it. You know, applications like chat GPT, where you're going to have tons of people using it constantly. In these AI PC, AI smartphone applications, it's going to be a, a batch size of one. It's going to be you, the user, hitting that. And at that point, it's just going to be what can deliver the most performance uh, with the lowest power draw uh, and with the greatest simplicity, because a simpler chip is going to have better margins. Well, the power issue is an, is an enormously important one. We've done a couple of stories this week about it in terms of, you know, the U.S.'s power grid demand for AI bit barns is going to be very, very high. Um, I'm wondering on a personal level as well whether, you know, sort of shifting this onto the local client is also going to cause some serious power problems. What's your view on where we're going on this? It's really hard to say in terms of, what's going to happen because anytime you try to, you know, pick three points and then extrapolate out, you usually mm -hmm. miss something. Um, yeah. But there are a couple of factors at play here, one of which is Moore's law is slowing down. So generally speaking, the, you know, generation on generation, you're going to get more performance, but you're not going to be able to say double the performance for the same power consumption anymore. Uh, and we're starting to see that play out. And so that's one of the problems facing the industry is that, the chips are having to get hotter in order and consume more power or in order to deliver those generational improvements. Large scale deployments of AI are exacerbating this problem because now we're not talking about a supercomputer with 30,000 GPUs. We're talking about multiple data centers, tens of data centers, 20, 30, mm -hmm. 40 uh, data centers with that many GPUs deployed in them. And traditionally, a rack might consume six kilowatts, maybe 12 if it's really highly dense. Now we're talking about 40, 80, 120 kilowatt racks. And so the data centers are having to renegotiate contracts with utilities in order to ensure that they're going to have enough capacity as these build out. Now, we like to look at this and extrapolate out and say, 
oh, we need 30,000 GPUs. And so we're going to need, you know, 25 or so megawatts of power rough, somewhere in there um, in order to power them. But it really depends on how quickly that infrastructure is going to be deployed, how fast you can get uh, the utilities up to speed in terms of delivering it. And so there are a lot of question marks. And, and because of that, we've seen all kinds of, of numbers being tossed around, you know, ranging from doubling uh, data center power consumption by the end of the decade, or mm -hmm. Uh, you know, as much as in the U.S., as much as 9% of all energy consumption being attributed to data centers by 2030. However, there are a lot of assumptions that go into those. <laughs> well, right. forecasts, yes, they're always um, up in the air. Um, it's going to come to a point where, like, data centers, you've got to have connectivity, you've got to have security, on, you've got to have um, cooling, and you're going to have to have a fission plant. That's basically it. Like, you know, it's the four. Like, I want to see that happen. I want to see data centers. Like, we're going to build it, and it's just automatically assumed there's just going to be a nuclear power plant next to well, it. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, we've been doing a lot of a lot of writing about small modular reactors, and it looks like that technology is really coming into its into its own at the moment. Um, I mean, we have had we did a story last week, I think it was, on how in fact data centers, if they are nuclear powered, could actually add to the grid. So uh, I, I'm wondering whether or not we're, <laughs> this this position is being overstated somewhat in terms of we're yes. all doomed. I, I, I talked to uh, an analyst yesterday about this, and they're looking at the situation uh, along the lines of, in order to who, uh, power these facilities and build new facilities, many of these data centers are going to have to who, provide their own power. And we're starting to see this already in constrained places like Dublin, where Microsoft has a, a large gas plant in order to even out the supply in a very constrained uh, you know, part of that nation. And, mm. you know, I Amazon is on smiling. Uh, natural <laughs> gas fuel cells in Oregon for similar reasons, but they, but that's because they can't get transmission lines to where they need them. Long term, using SMRs, you, you could uh, conceivably get to a point where the utilities and the data center operators, the, the people building the shells, not actually managing the stuff inside of them, um, are, are basically uh, utilities in themselves, and they can feed energy back into the grid, um, you know, during period in between training runs or during periods of low demand. Well, if the grid is actually capable of taking that input, but yeah, I mean, it, in terms of actually using this, though, uh, Brandon, you looked at Palantir and and what their latest bid for glory is. I mean, this is a company which sets off red flags for many people. But explain to us what's going on, please. Yeah, Palantir, right? Famously named for that, <clears throat> I would say, right? Uh, in its very nature, harmless or neutral object in uh, in Lord of the Rings that is turned to evil purposes, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> for being all seeing, right? Well, Palantir, right? Obviously, is is has the reputation for for its data consumption as well. Uh, and this week, they scored a, a big new contract with the uh, with the Pentagon. It was a four hundred and eighty million dollar contract to expand use of Maven, which is kind of probably it and the DoD's most famous AI program. Um, and very so popular with Google you know, employees, yes. Yeah, Google was Google was previously involved in it, but Palantir took it over after Google employees raised a stink and, and Google officially backed off of the program, which if anyone's familiar with the story, Maven is basically a, a an AI uh, engine designed to help uh, the, you know the military distinguish targets from um, non-targets in the in the field, and it doesn't actually make any firing decisions or, or you know provide any firing solutions. Yeah. it just kind of is designed I to was make say, yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, it'll come eventually, right? Give it time. Oh yeah. Um, but uh, but for now, humans are still in the loop in finally saying like, yeah, that that's actually you know a uh, a vehicle, or it looks like you know a platoon of guys hiding under some some you know radar reflecting camo net, right? As opposed to just a physical formation or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, so so the way the price release sounded, it was simply um, some new prototypes, right? But when I talked to um, to Palantir myself, they were like, oh, no, 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 this is not for prototypes. This is to expand use of Maven across the entirety of the Department of Defense, right? Because so right now it's, it's being fielded it. right now, like it's being used in the Middle East. There are, um, I, in my story, I mentioned a Kentucky National Guard unit that uh, reported about its use of Maven in the field um, in Qatar while it's been there. Um, 
But this would see it expanded across the DoD, right? So we're looking at more targeting capabilities, more AI usage, and more Palantir fingers in more DoD pies, basically. Well, it's, it's, the... it's, it's, it's targeting, like, if it's going to be used for targeting, as one reader said, I just want to say, one reader said, like, the people of Moscow, uh, Idaho. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need to watch Moscow, new... Ohio, better watch out if AI yeah, is but... doing the targeting. Yeah, 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 yeah wherever, <laughs> Well, it's, state it's it the old joke. What's the difference between a terrorist encampment and an Afghan wedding? Don't ask me. I just press the button on the drone. But yes, I mean, it's, <laughs> this is going to happen, you know, at, at right. some point. You know, AI is going to start taking decisions involving human lives in this way, surely. Oh, yeah, it very well could, right? Thing. I mean, yeah, I mean, Palantir basically told me, no, 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 you know, there's no, there's, this, this is not, you know, but again, right, this is, this is for now, all right? I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. sure that statement always has an asterisk next to it, right? <laughs> I mean, um, I don't imagine that the DOD would publicly state that it was going to take humans out of the loop in identifying targets using AI, right? I imagine that would be, that would involve a lot of blowback from multiple channels, uh, including, I'm sure, lots of politicians who would be unhappy about it. Not all of them, surely, right? No one really complained when we started striking people remotely using drones, right? This just seems like the next evolution of that. Yeah, so we've got basically the chips are being built, power is being sucked, and now we've got the military on the game as well. So, um, I wonder yeah. if anyone. Did... I wonder. I wonder if anyone um, was. I wonder how people felt when heat-seeking missiles were announced and they were launched because i mean at what point do, you, do things start becoming artificially intelligent like mm -hmm. you know the first as i understand it the first heat seeking missiles were just very mechanical it had like a sensor on the front and the, as the sensor moved as the sensor moved to stay locked onto the to the exhaust or the heat coming from the target it would mechanically steer the thing and then it became electronic and then at what point does this start becoming artificially intelligent like at what point do you at what point, like when you put this stuff in, let's say that you do let the thing fire the missile, or let's say you do let this uh, AI fly the missile for you, or fly whichever weaponry you're going to be doing. Like at what point, I wonder, I'm just thinking out loud, I wonder at what point does, do, do we start saying, oh, this is now intelligent and we should start getting upset about it, versus, well, this is just a very clever set of algorithms that are mm. following something that, you know, would have been called machine learning a few years ago, but now gets called AI. So I think the bigger concern among many leaders is that uh developed nations will get this technology start employing ai not only in target selection but executing on those targets mm. and it will create a lopsided uh confrontation in which loss is measured in dollars for developed nations and lives for the others yes it's going to be a fairly well okay we always try to keep a happy tone on this but it is going to be a very <laughs> interesting way to see how this works out and then we well thank you very it. much um yeah, I don't know. It's curious times on the AI front, and um, yeah, I'm so just going to get are, curiouser. Well, but yeah. these are ethical, power, and hardware issues that we're all going to have to sort out. There's no point in putting our head under the blanket, as it were. But we'll keep on looking at them, and uh, we'll no doubt be back for another kettle to discuss this afterwards. Um, if you prefer the audio version, you can get it from your usual podcast channels. But in the meantime, we'll be back next week, and thank you for joining in. <laughs>